myself on occasion and stuff. And I, I remember one time I was uh, in line in a restaurant and this gentleman tried to explain to me what a redneck was. So I, I didn't want to tell him that, that any major demonstration in the 70s, I was there. So I think there's always that little uh, disconnect when they see an older Asian woman and they think of grandma and things like that. So anyway, today's talk is on making of a postpartum perfect storm. And this is sort of like a new concept for us. And, and, and I didn't realize that the concept of postpartum justice is actually a new concept. Because when you Google it, it doesn't appear anywhere. And I was really surprised because um, when we started talking about this, we first started talking about reproductive justice, and so we are just imagining what well, uh, postpartum justice is going to be part of that picture. But then when we Google it, there was no postpartum justice that came out. And then the uh, hashtags, so all these new things that young people uh, work with, also there's nothing that comes up when you use postpartum justice. So I sort of felt on us to say, well, if we really want to study this area, we will have to define it. And I think we need those definitions so that we could uh, really understand what it is that we're dealing with and sort of sharing a, a, a vocabulary. So you probably have all seen articles and all that in recent months, especially in the last, our last six months to a year. A lot of these articles are coming out, and they all emphasize this idea that we're in a crisis. And in many ways, truly a crisis. So a crisis is defined as a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. And when we look at data like this, death per 100,000 life births, what you see is a gradual increase from the 90s to the 2000s for that 10 years. And then there was this dramatic jump since that time. But that's not only the only thing that sort of worries us, because you see that this, the other countries in the world didn't go in the same direction. So there was like some unusual um, viruses that are attacking new mothers across the world, but, but something's going on in the United States, but it's not going on in the rest of the world. So the rest of the world you see a gradual, de a gradual decrease and a continual decrease. In the United States, there was a gradual increase and a dramatic increase further up. So what's on a lot of people's minds, a lot of the articles that came out in popular press, they're all interested in this, why is the United States maternal mortality rising? So this is, an, this is was not an article, it was more, a, more of an opinion piece. Because American Medical Journal tend to be a very um, a conservative uh, organization. It's, part of, it's the, the top professional uh, medical association in the United States. It tends to be very conservative, but I picked that because you know, it's probably read most widely by a lot of clinicians. So this is an opinion piece on why he thinks that there is the rise in U.S. maternal mortality. So these are sort of a hard part of what he sees, and then you will see the same thing reflected in a lot of the articles that, that would be. So the concept that, well, there's been a decrease in service in recent years. So funding is cut. So prevention is down. So that account for some of that increase. The C-section rate had increased, which is true. So all these, two, all these things, in fact, are true. But what we want to know is, what is the, the root problems? What is causing it at the root level? And not just the, the just on the surface, some of the things that we can see. Okay, so they, they do notice that's the growing prevalence of chronic conditions. So they notice that uh, people are, uh, tend to be way heavier, uh, there are diabetes that are increasing, heart disease. So women coming into pregnancy and delivering with more complicated problems. <coughs> Probably true, but what caused that though? Okay. So something is causing that. Why, why are young women coming in with more chronic diseases? Another reason they all often cite is mothers are older. 
which is also true, because if you look at the data, the number of uh, births in each camp, in each age group, like maybe 50, uh, say uh, 20 to 25, 25. So the, the group that has the highest increase are mothers who are over 40. So that, that group has the highest uh, increase in birth. So maybe that is the reason. So then he goes on to say, what well, disparities exist? So when you look at look at a lot of data, you cannot help but to notice that African American are three to four times, and in some cities, seven times more likely to die than mothers, than white mothers in the same city. So you cannot ignore that. But as you would always see, that disparity exists. But there's always this big but there. And they say, well, he said, well, white mothers' death rates are also getting larger. And I would really suggest to you that all these publicity and all these uh, uh, concern in recent months is actually due to that. That in fact, what they're seeing is white mothers are also dying in increased rate. Because you're gonna see data that, that this, the disparity in the black community is not new. That's been there, because when you read about it, you say, oh my God, you know, this is like, it's just happening right now. But we're gonna find out that the disparity has, has been there for a long, long time. But no one paid attention to it, or no one raised that issue. So lack of access, that's always the case, because oftentimes uh, it's just the nature of our healthcare system that we have to have a key to unlock that service. And then it finally he makes the, oh, okay, another thing that I always skip is, uh, we are, we are keeping record better. So there are deaths that we didn't count because we didn't have good records. But that didn't make a lot of sense because European, I'm sure they keep very good records because most of those records, uh, well, most of those countries have um, either single payer or national insurance. So there's only one entity that pays out on all these bills. So it's much easier for them to keep record. But for United States, it's true. You, know, you have thousands of insurance companies, and each insurance company may have different policy, and they may call different things by different names, and what they will pay and what would they not pay. So to get data in the US system, it is difficult. But to say that the rise is due to record keeping, you could, you could, you could say yes. You know, so we didn't, we didn't have very good record keeping, so there were a lot of deaths we didn't count, and now we can't be seeing them. But that doesn't account for the discrepancy with other countries. So why would ours be higher than other countries? If anything, our rates would be artificially low before, right? We didn't get to keep good records. And now we just should be just catching up. So if, if, if their rates are true, and now our rates are getting true, they should be equal. So there shouldn't be the, the disparity between uh, United States and other countries. So I don't think there's much there. So finally, he, he sees the saying, pregnancy and childbirth are risky. Now, this is something that oftentimes is, is ignored in, in the medical establishment because there's a certain cavalier attitude about childbirth. It's like everybody gives birth and they all do well, we don't have to see them for six weeks. So what is his solution? So he said, well, you know, there are, all these things are happening, but his approach is, the concept of a rising tide would lift all boats. So this is saying another version of the trickle-down theory. So you know, if we uh, take away the tax from the rich, <coughs> then somehow that money is going to trickle down, and everybody's going to be better off. And we know that had never worked, right? So the trickle-down theory is not something recent. It's just been we just see that the that the disparity of wealth and and resources just grow in the last 30, 40 years. But this is a very, very common concept, though. The idea, well, we gotta make the healthcare system better and everybody's gonna benefit. So this is the usual clinician uh, sort of look at the situation, and, and most commonly in the mass media also presented in the same way. So what we want to do is introduce the concept of justice in that. So, we're, this is the public health um, definition of justice. And we want you to, by the time we finish this class, we hope to be able to introduce a little bit more to this concept. For right now, in public health, they look at justice as being 
fairness and reasonableness especially in the way people are treated or decisions are made. Our account of justice stresses the fair disbursement of common advantages and the sharing of common burdens. Now here, these two aspects of justice, health improvement for the population and fair treatment of the disadvantaged create a richer understanding of public health. So this is already different from the previous, uh, the, uh, this version of how things are going to be uh, resolved. So here, the, the, the public health justice version is that, yes, we need to improve the health of the entire population. But at the same time, we have to have fair treatment of the disadvantaged. So it's not just like a rising tide in both worlds. So this presentation, we're going to suggest that um, there's, a, there's a perfect storm. And perfect storm is not just one aspect, two aspect, but it's many, many aspects, many forces coming together that makes something worse than what it had been. So we want to understand that. We, we want to understand what is the postponed part of reality in the United States. And we want to, right now, we were able to isolate these five elements. One is a for-profit healthcare system. Two is racism. Three is sexism. Fourth is individualism. And the five is abandonment of traditional postpartum wisdom. So we think if you look at the root causes, these seem to be the underlying issues. And at some point at the end of the semester, we want to define postpartum justice because that's what the provide the new mothers of protection from the storm. How are they going to get out of the storm? Is it just improve the healthcare system, or, or really there's more than that? So perfect storm is usually defined an event with a rare combination of circumstances drastically aggravates the event. So what is the event that we are talking about? So we're talking about the postpartum period, the aftermath of having given birth. But it's not a rare event. So in the United States in 2014, 52.4% of women ages 15 to 44 had given birth. So that means over half of the population of reproductive age had given birth. So this is not a rare event, obviously. But if you think about it, it's really an invisible event in the, in the US culture. So what's the first thing you think about when, when people say postpartum? Was part of depression. Yes, that's the, that's the most common association. But there's no term for that period that you call when someone had given birth that month or that 40 days or the 60 days. So when, when we don't have a term for it, then it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in people's thinking. It doesn't exist in, in, in the clinician's mind. It doesn't exist anywhere. There's no care. There's no concern for that period of time. So now getting back to the analogy of, of the storm. So storm can be of different magnitude, right? So it could be a, a big rainstorm, and all you need is an umbrella. Or it could be something much, much more severe. But we need to know the severity of the storm in order to be able to uh, be able to provide prevention. So in other words, if it's going to be a rainstorm, well, you know, you just bring an umbrella to work. Well, if you know the rain is going to be hitting at 20, 30 inches in the next 10, 20 hours, and the levee's going to break, that's a different concern you're going to have. And then there's going to be different sets of recommendations you want to give out to the population. Right? So for us, we have to be able to know how severe is this storm in, in the postpartum period. Is it a little storm? A big storm? Severe? But the problem is this it's very difficult to measure. How do you measure the postpartum storm? Other storm you could measure the velocity of the rain, how quickly it's coming down, um, the velocity of the wind, direction of the wind, all those factors that you could have a scientific way of um, uh, measurement. And of course now we have satellites, so you just take a picture, you know exactly which way it's heading, and you know so. Um, that are we're much more sophisticated. 
But in postpartum storm, I think we are probably back in the 1950s when you think of um, weather uh, forecasting. So we don't really have a lot of, lot of uh, skills and a lot of uh, uh, tools that we have. But these are some of the basic measurements you would use in trying to figure out what, the, what, what is the experience when a, a new mother, um, after the new mother gave birth. So these are the, the common measurements, maternal mortality, pregnancy-related age, race, ethnicity, causes of death, comorbidities, behavior. So I'm going to go through at least uh, a few of them to, to make sure you understand, especially for students who are interested in reading up more, uh, more articles, academic articles, and, and research being done. Because you're going to be surprised how different these measurements are. So depending on what you're reading, you may get a very, very different uh, idea. Okay, for example, <coughs> pregnancy-related death is counted within one year. The end of the pregnancy, one year. But maternal mortality is 42 days. Okay, 42 days, that's exactly six weeks. So your first, the protocol now, after mother gives birth, her first appointment with her OB is six weeks. Okay, but we are counting death that happens before she may get to the first doctor's appointment. Okay, so, and our concern is maternal, with this set of data is we are really under counting the severity of the storm. Because if someone dies in 43rd day, it doesn't count. Not in this data, not in maternal mortality. It counts in pregnancy related death. But when you read uh, most uh, popular press, they're, they're not reporting the pregnancy related death, they're reporting maternal mortality. So most of the you read is maternal mortality. And in maternal mortality, there's another thing that we need to pay attention to, especially if you're going to be going on to um, analyze uh, or understand this, this issue more. And that's the concept of maternal mortality ratio mm -hmm. and maternal mortality rate. Mm -hmm. So in popular press, we, we keep on hearing maternal mortality rate. We, we talk about rate because rate is a, more, um, it's a more common word and it's also more easily understood. But in fact, when they are talking about mortality rate, they're really talking about ratio. So they are talking about number of maternal deaths per certain number of live births within the same period of time, times 100,000. So, so usually it's given the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. So that officially, for, for epidemiologists, statisticians, that is a ratio. Okay, but this is what, this, this data that most of the uh, public press use. But what they really mean is the ratio and not the rate. It doesn't really matter because that much, we need, we just, you're just reading on for the popular press. Because the concept is things are not going well. Things are getting worse. So that's the, the main concept. So that's OK. But for people who want to understand and want to understand what they are reading, because you'll be getting all your information from CDC and, and, and from uh, WHO, and they stick to this, popular, this um, definition. So maternal mortality rate is actually the number of maternal deaths over the number of women of reproductive age of that same period. So in that one year, how many women died? But how many women are of reproductive age? And so this is going to give you a very, very different number than this one. Um, so if you're going to be reading uh, articles in the future, uh, more from the scientific journals, then you want to make sure you know uh, the difference between the two. So other measurements, causes of death, what is killing uh, new mothers, and age. Age is a big, big factor in terms of death. So if you look at under 20, the race is 7.1. So death per 100,000 live births, 7.1. But if you're 35 years and older, it's 32.3. So the risk is what? Four times? Okay, so age matters a lot.
Okay, so these are some of the commonly used measurements. But unfortunately, when we concentrate on maternal mortality, we are only looking at the tip of the iceberg. So we're looking at this, this part. Women who die at 42 years, so we understand what they die of, and what are the comorbidities. They're using just this set of data. But what about the women die within a year? So that was a pregnancy-related death. What about near deaths? So it's for every one woman that died, another 60 women, 70 women comes close to dying. Okay, so every one of those near deaths, maybe they have slightly better insurance that might have saved them. Otherwise, you would be in this category. Okay, so beyond near deaths, how about complications? Because there are a lot of women with complications that maybe require them to go into uh, the ER. Maybe they just need a, a, a kind of a, a blood transfusion. So there were complications. But they didn't cause them to die, and they didn't go near death. But those are traumatic experiences for women. And of course, you mentioned about postpartum depression. In fact, this is the biggest number that we also hear about so often because you know, it's such a common occurrence that we think every woman should have a depression because that seems to be associated with uh, giving birth. And it's true because 70 to 80 percent of new mothers will experience the baby blues. 10 to 20 percent of new mothers will experience clinical depression. So that uh, actually uh, satisfies the, the clinical definitions of depression. So again, we're looking at just the tip of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg of this crisis in postpartum period. So the first conjecture we want to present to you is it has to do with the healthcare system that we have. And basically it's a for-profit healthcare system. Now it's not about spending. Well, so you said for-profit, therefore we don't want to spend money, so therefore we are being stingy, and therefore we're getting poor health. As it turns out, it's not true. When you look compared to other countries, again, these are all um, rich countries, so, so it's not, we don't want to compare apple with oranges. If we compare it with some very poor countries, of course, you know, we're going to outspend them and because they have no choice because that's their resources. But if you compare it to other countries that have similar resources, this is what we're seeing. So we are spending $10,000 per capita per person in our country on health. Then when you look at everybody else, everybody else is more in the range of 4000 5,000. But we didn't get more for what we paid for. So it's not like we pay, we pay more, and therefore we're getting best care. No. And in fact, it's the absolute opposite. We are rock bottom. So they compared uh, us to 10 other countries. So we rank number one in terms of expenditure. We spend the most money. And then in terms of quality of care, we were last. And in terms of what we do spend, only 3% of what we spend goes to public health and prevention. Okay. Only 3%. And WHO and the other data compare us to sort of similar countries as uh, countries that are uh, fairly well off. Now this is going to be including everybody else. And when you include with everybody else, we rank 37. We are behind Oman. We are behind Portugal. We are behind Colombia, Cyprus. But yet we spent ten thousand, more than ten thousand dollars per person in the United States. This is another way of looking at it. So this is performance. So the higher up you are in this axis, that means you're doing better. And this axis is how much you spend. So further up this way, you're spending more. So US is an outline. We spend more, 
yet performance be the lowest. <clears throat> With this, I'm just going to I'm going to provide the, the slides to everybody after the, the talk, so you know. But this would be very good for students who are interested in international health. So this is a really nice uh, website to go in and, and you can click different countries. It tells you uh, how the countries uh, fund their health care, <coughs> what is their um, health outcome. So this is very very useful. From that, so from that, you could see that. This is how um, health insurance coverage, so this is another way of looking at health care. So how well is the population being covered um, by insurance? I mean, you look at the, the numbers here. All these countries, they cover their population 100%. None of them have to rely on private insurance at all. <coughs> And then when you look at the United States, we cover about 86% of the population, you know, 85%, and that's in combination of private and public. So about 30% are covered by public, but the majority of the people have to rely on public, on the private insurance. I mean, so 15% of our population has no coverage at all, not, not private, not public. And that 53% that does have health insurance, private insurance, is very tenuous. You lose your job, you lost that health insurance. So does our health status have something to do with this? Absolutely. And then we know that health insurance coverage is also not uniformly distributed in the population. So it has to do with your race, has to do with your economic background, has to do with the jobs you have, a lot of other factors, language, all those are, are uh, challenges of getting health insurance. So you can see for African American, for Native American, this percentage is low. And also another statistic they, they um, use is, well, how equal is the care? In other words, um, are people getting what they need? When you compare to other countries, you see this glaring discrepancy here. Because in the United States, more than a third of the people, and, and this is uh, below average income, so more than a third of the people had to uh, not get a recommended test or a treatment or follow-up because of cost, because they can't afford it, because the co-pay is too high. When you compare to other countries, they do even better than the people who are supposed to have above average income because they cover 100%, right? They have insurance that cover them 100%, the population 100%. And we have a lot of people that are falling through the cracks that can't afford health care. So, U.S. healthcare system, expensive, low quality, unequal, and not prevention oriented, right? So those data we saw in the only spent me 3%. But then we have to look at the, the ratio, the, data from, from the past. So for the last century, 1900 to 1997, you see this dramatic drop in maternal mortality rate. And that is to be applauded because there's a lot of advances that have been made, so we cannot ignore that. But, I, but at the same time, I think it's this data to seeing how well we're doing that make people very, very complacent. They say, oh, we, we, we have solved that problem. We no longer have to worry about the maternal health. Um, situation. This is another set of data we could we could look at, it, and, and that is C-section rate, cesarean rate. And this is another thing that's very shocking. But if you look at 1970, it's 5.5% of the, the delivery were done through C-section. <coughs> 2012. 32.8, almost 33%. That is a big, big jump. 
a very short period of time. The question is, are they all necessary? Are all those C-section rates, all those C-section surgery necessary? And when you think about it, it couldn't be because we had pretty good data back then. And we had very low mortality rate already at that time. So if we had all these C-sections that we should have, that should have been done and we, we didn't do for whatever reason, this, the, the death rate at that time should, should be higher. Because now we are doing better, right? We're giving women the need of C-section. But we're not seeing that. And in fact, what, what the study they show, C-section is, the risk for C-section death is actually three times of a vaginal birth. So it's not benign. But yet, you know, most of, like, all, in my family, I think the, all my niece and, and um, wives of nephew, I would say two out of three delivery were C-section. And it's so, so common. Because for the obstetrician, it's very, it's very it re, they know how to do the, 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 the C-section very quickly. Three, four minutes, they in and out, done. And that probably has a lot to do, and their propensity during C-section, one is, is probably the, the, the legal situation. So if something happened to the baby, and you know, the, 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 their, their liability is going to be very, very high. So there's that concern that, well, if I let the, the women labor for several miles, who knows what will happen? Okay, but now I could go in and I will take the baby out. Or maybe it's 4.30, he needs to go home. Okay, so whatever the reason are that what we see is an unusual increase in C-section rate. So there has to be some sort of explanation. And we have to look at, are all those C-sections necessary? And that's a very difficult um, research to do. But it's a necessary research. So the healthcare system, so we, we the first four, we sort of recognize it. In general, that's the, the, the situation. And then when, when added to the postpartum situation, we see that there's an increase in surgical interventions. There's a cavalier attitude towards postpartum, so we don't have a name for it. Um, we don't see the woman back until it's already six weeks after. And then you have to realize that the majority of women go back to work by that time. And they, they, they will always say that the rate of women actually making that appointment is very, very low. Whatever happened, already happened. If she died, she died. But anything else, any trauma she went through, she probably recovered by that time. And then I think that also gives, you know, you're going through training and OB and all that. That may give you a very wrong impression. So, oh, all the women are doing well. They can come back to see you. And then there's some data to show that, that Teaching, research, and resources are, are, are very, very low in for, for, for maternal health in general. So a lot of the resources when it's maternal and child health, it actually went to the child. You know, so it's infant health that they're, they're, they're very concerned about. Not to say it's wrong. We, we want to be concerned about infant health. But there has to be research and, and resources that go into the postpartum period as well. Otherwise, this is what we're going to see. So, conjecture number two is racism. Racism has to do something. Has something to do with the rates that we are seeing. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time on this concept because it's, it's quite a difficult concept to prove, unfortunately. And it's difficult to have data to say, oh, this is due to racism. How do we even measure that? So we're going to have several speakers coming in. So next week, we're going to have that one. Um, Let's talk. She's going to talk about disparities in maternal health, so that's next week. And then I think in about three, four weeks, we're going to have Dr. Chambers, and she's going to come and talk about her study <coughs> measuring racism. And that's going to be very interesting because you know she has some very new approaches to measurement of uh, racism. In terms of very, very common knowledge, in terms of racism, we know that there's institutional racism, there are, there's cultural racism, and interpersonal racial discrimination. <coughs> and when you see an OB, a male OB, 
uh, a white OB. It's not that that person is a bad person, not at all. But that person, and it could be any person, grows up in society. And this society, all the institutional racism is going to be set in place. So for example, there is now plenty of data that show the housing policy of the country discriminate against black. And by that virtue of that, it cuts off a lot of advancement opportunity, economic advancement opportunity for the black community. So we sort of trickle down. Cultural racism, you know, all the mass media, all the um, images, and they did a study where they took like something like a, a thousand, I mean a million um, words association, and they look at what some of the words associated with black and what are the words associated with uh, uh, white. And in that study, they, they see that words like violent, uh, lazy, those are the words that come up most recently in terms of when, when, when the word black is, is um, uh, black appears. And this affects people in their entire life from, from childhood on. They're exposed to that. Interpersonal racial discrimination. So all those are different aspects of racism. I'm not going to go into uh, uh, more because I think we're going to have several sessions in the coming, uh, coming weeks. And there's one very important concept here in um, OBGYN, and it's that the, the oppressive roles that gynecologists had perpetrate on the black community. So there's this book, Medical Bondage, that talks about that. So how the origin of American gynecology uh, sort of on the shoulder, founded on the shoulder of African-American women, because they did experimental surgery, uh, treatment on that population to, for them to gain that skill. So we are looking at, so we saw that data where uh, Amer American women are dying at an increased rate. And if you break that down, we, look, we, we see this. So maternal mortality for black compared to other populations is three, four, five, six times higher. And depending, this, this is overall population. If you look at um, uh, New York City, and, and I'm going to show you that, <coughs> it's going to show an even worse picture. So there's been a lot of attempts to look at racism. So this is um, David Williams, one of the more um, seasoned researcher in that area. So people who are interested in reading more, this is a, a good article to, to start off with. So basically, in, in his study, what he found that racism is not just the big experiences, it's not like the job that was denied you or the housing denied you, but also a lot of little indignities. They all affect health. It affects your immune system, it affects your uh, heart, it affects uh, just every aspect of your health. And that leads to coronary heart disease and giving birth to babies with low birth rate. So it's not just like if, if you weren't treated well in a restaurant, it's not just your blood pressure goes up and then comes down and, and, and off you go. But rather, those repeated trauma, those repeated micro trauma, tends to affect people's health. So when, when women coming in with more chronic illnesses, it may not be because she didn't take care of herself. But it's just that the trauma she's facing in the outside world had contributed to her, her health status. And the effects are irrespective of educational level, health insurance status, and job status. So uh, Williams gave a, maybe an example. So in 1970, the Yale graduating class they look at the death rate for male in that class, 1970 in Yale, and the white male death rate. For blacks, graduating from Yale, so they should be doing fairly well, highly educated, their death rate was three times higher than the white counterpart. So something else is going on, so it's not just education, you know, so we always like to say, oh, education, we have to give them health promotion, we have to give 
public health education, that's going to be helpful. Yes and no. Okay. So remember that that set of data. Okay, and discrimination could be both intentional and unintentional. So it could be implicit bias and all that. So all those we're going to go into uh, more in the future articles and talks. So this is a very complicated chart that he presents. So I just want to show it to you just to say the efforts that go into research to try to understand this problem is not so easy. But the data is there. So what does it look like? What does racism look like in the postpartum period? Well, in New York City, your risk of dying, if you're black, is seven times higher in previous year, in the third part of this century. But in recent times, 12 times higher. So it's not just that four times the national average. Because in selected city and selected environment, your risk, if you're black, goes up dramatically. Now, next set of data, I want to show you that it, it's not something new, because I think when we read a lot of uh, articles recently, we, we have a, at least it's set in a way that, oh, oh, this is something new, we've been learning this uh, just very recently, and we're shocked. Okay, so this is MMWR, so this is mortality, well, this is a morbidity mortality weekly uh, report. So this is something that the CDC, that's our, um, epidemiology arm in the entire country, so they are responsible for collecting all sorts of data, you know, how much you weigh, how much you, what do you eat, uh, the, the death rate, the, um, all the data usually comes through CDC and people you know, sort of massage it and try to get, the, try to get a look at a, a different aspect. So this is one of the reports that came out in 1998. Yeah, 1998. So that's exactly 20 years ago. 20 years ago. So in their conclusion is, when compared with white women, black women continue, would continue, to have four times the risk for dying from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. So even back 20 years ago, this is a continual status. So in other words, I, I didn't have time to go back how far back it goes. So that means 20 years ago they know flat were dying at four times the rate of white humiliation. But that didn't cause a scare. That didn't cause New York Times to write an article or NPR to write an article. It was when recently when the white mothers are also dying at an increased rate. That's what created the sense of crisis. Something's going on. That's not to undermine that it's not. It is indeed a crisis, but I want to emphasize that this has been a crisis in the black community and the Native American community for a long, long time. Again, this is that same data set that we've been looking at. So why is it, why is it that, that there is that difference? So another idea that we would like to present to you is that sexism is a major force in the postpartum period to one. How does that play out in, in, in the postpartum period? Now, right now that there's a debate whether maternity care should be considered essential benefits. Okay, why is this argument coming back up again? Well, for those who are older, who before Obama care, so in other words, people who had insurance, health insurance, you would remember if you had given birth, you're going to get a bill for the baby part, and there's a separate bill for your part. Because for the mother, maternity care is not covered in the same way. So you may have a, a max, like that you may cover $1,000 in maternity care. And the rest is <coughs> on you. Like the infant, would, whatever your insurance, insurance policy is, at least, right? Uh, they will cover you for 80% and your copay is 20%, whatever, and it will apply for the infant. But not you, not as a new mother. Because in the healthcare system, that the idea that maternity care is somehow is not considered an essential health benefit. So it's not covered in your health insurance. And this is not so long ago. Obamacare is what? How long ago? Six, six years ago? 
to prior to that, that's the, 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 the state of affairs. But of course now, the, the argument is, they want to even get, get rid of Obamacare, right? So now the, they're revisiting issues. So, so if we want to get rid of Obamacare, because Obamacare argued that, no, maternity care is part of essential care. So it's, there's 10 essential care under um, Obamacare, and maternity care is one of them. But if they're going to get rid of BCA, get rid of Obamacare, they're going to have to re-argue that out. Say, well, what should we cover? What should we not cover? So this is going to come up again, and that is maternity care is somehow not essential. And I think that's a very difficult concept to, to really understand. Birth is not essential, then where do we all come from? The human species came from the act of someone giving birth to all of us, right? If that's not essential, if we cannot support that, what kind of society are we? You know, what kind of society do we have? Another way of looking at how society is looking at the, 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 the postpartum period is the idea of maternity. Well, if they don't think giving birth is essential, covering for their care is essential, certainly they're not going to pay women to stay home to recover. And for that reason, you see, the United States is the only country, and you, you see Estonia. Estonia has more than what? How many, how many months did that be? 85 is more than a year, year and a half. Right? Hungary, all these are not necessarily rich nations, but they have a different outlook on what care they should provide for women who have just delivered. And the United States says zero. Not one, not two, not three, zero. Okay, so we don't currently have a, a uh, national policy. So we're going to have a speaker coming in that's going to be talking about that. That there is certainly a movement building now, clamoring for um, maternity leave and family leave, paid family leave. Because now the maternity that people do get is based on the em employer's uh, policy. So they, some some. Uh, Companies they do have pay maternity, leave, but that's not a national policy. So our society as a whole does not recognize that women needs care. And I think that, again it gets back to the idea that <coughs> probably women's work doesn't matter. So this, this is some this is women's giving birth, and somehow that doesn't matter as much as other things in society. And that's shown up in in pay, right? So women are paid less than men doing similar work. And all that's gonna impact on, on, on the economic health and of the of the family. In the workforce, forty one percent of women work part time. Now we know what that means to people's health insurance because if you work part time you're not gonna get health insurance. This is another set of data and that is for men, after the birth of their first baby, their income doesn't go down. But if you look at women after the first baby, it plummets. Because she probably has to take time off, she has to care for uh, more than one child, whatever the situation is, that the burden of taking care of babies are not equally shared. So I'm gonna switch over to what does sexism look like in the healthcare workforce? Okay, so this is a set of data on medical students. So female medical students throughout most of last century, from 19, 1915 all the way up to the 70s, were single digits, single digits. That's not so long ago, right? I mean, I lived through that period of time. But it wasn't until the passage of Title IX. Are people familiar with Title IX? Right, so a lot of the, the funding and, and the federal funding are sort of uh, controlled by what they take it by uh, what are the what you can and cannot do under Title IX. And what Title IX specifies is, is the uh, that you cannot discriminate against women as a defeat of the equality of the of male and female in, in any programs that receive federal money. And it's only then that schools like Harvard Schools like Princeton, school like Yale, school like Stanford become co-ed because they got federal money. 
it wasn't because you know they they got um, uh, some people they sort of interpret oh this is the seventies they saw the civil rights movement and they got um, they got smarter or, or they got inspired and they changed their way no it was about money so the school would not have gotten federal money unless they had made things equal so that drive a lot of the the, the recent changes so so you can see within two years female medical students was double digits, almost a quarter. And now, I think this last year was the first time that the number of women in medicine, in medical school, actually surpassed male. Now in some school, that happened, <laughs> and in some school that had happened long, long ago. At UCSF, that, that happened you know, so, uh, a while ago. But nation as a whole. Now, but then you have to look at that in all, most of last century, that the medical system was very, very much dominated by male. Again, it's not to say male did this particular person, this particular doctor have to see good or bad, but it's the condition under which he grew up, the institution he grew up under, the, the cultural images that he had of women. <coughs> and one particular part we want to emphasize is the history of midwife. So up until uh, Marx, so called modern medicine, in the turn of the 19th century, all the birthing were done by women. There's very few. I, I don't think I've come across a culture that, that men deliver. So it's always men, I mean, always women. Okay. But when they started this new medicine, new medical system in the United States, it was totally dominated by men. So when they started, the fewer obstetrics were, were all men. And that had a very, very drastic change in terms of the treatment of women in, the, in, in, in medicine. Because now we were being cared for by men who had no concepts of what that birthing process is like and have had no historical experience with it. So it was not a case where the midwives, the women, had always delivered baby. Now you have uh, a better, a better uh, scientific knowledge and you're moving that field forward. But rather, there was a total break. There was a total break in knowledge of, uh, of postpartum care. And now it's a completely different set of people who have taken over. And to establish their credibility, they have to destroy the credibility of those who had delivered babies before. So for midwives, so they are, they are now accused of being um, a witch. They are accused of being unscientific. So, Basically, for a very long time, midwives were pretty much shut out of the, the healthcare system. And it's only in recent, I would say recent years and recent decades, that there's a uh, movement to bring them back. Now, how does that affect when you have a male perspective taking care of your mothers? What, how does that look like? Well, it looks like this. When you're ready to deliver, you're asked to lie down on the flat surface. That is totally unscientific. Because you just stand there, this is the woman, this is the womb. The birth canal goes this way, right? So you have six, seven, eight pounds baby. The baby has to come out. You have her lying down. The baby has to go this way. <laughs> Where's gravity? This way. The baby wants to go this way. But the birth canal is that way. It doesn't make sense. But because that's how it's established, even though now there are more obstetrician who are women and, and, and residency program the women, that they still have to use these contraptions. But that's because historically that's how culturally that was has been set up. Now contrast that to Navajo. But, but this makes a lot, lot more sense. So she's holding on to ropes or something that would help stabilize her. And her birth canal is straight, so that gravity could work with her and not against her. And could you imagine just sitting there trying to push a baby out in the opposite direction? So anyway, so this is an example of what happens when people who are dealing with the situation are not really uh, people who have experience going through that. Okay, so getting back to sexism. For, for women living in a sexist society, so they, they have less income, they're less economically secure, 
higher percentage work in part-time uh, employment. Um, and their OBGYN service is going to be culturally male-dominated. And of course, society as a whole <coughs> does not value that birth process. So it's not an essential service, and the maternity leave are not offered. So another reason why we think that rate is going up is the abandonment of traditional postpartum wisdom because all these years, if, if, we, if women had not known how to take care of themselves, the, the race would have died out, right? The human species would have died out. So there's something women know how to do right that allow that human being to survive all this time. But because of that break, now the, the OBGYN is content entirely within the, the medical system, all that knowledge is either shut out or, or buried. But this is not entirely so, because we know that in a lot of different communities, that still exists. And then I think that's part of how we, um, the, our class and, and people who are interested in sort of got started, is, is trying to recover some of those knowledge. So one study that was done on um, looking at anthropological studies of so people who had studied different cultures in the previous, in the, in the older times, so in other words, not studying about the Pakistani uh, society now and looking at the tradition now, but we're looking at much uh, older period of time. And what they found was postpartum disorder, including the baby blues, were virtually non-existent. Because that was something that, that it seems to um, dovetail with how we how we think, because you never hear of other cultures talking about postpartum blues. Because otherwise, there should be a lot of uh, story about how, oh, the boogeyman's going to get you after you have your baby if you're not careful, right? There should be a lot of folk tales if postpartum depression is such a common thing. Because in modern medicine, we explained it totally on hormonal terms. We said, well, you know, your hormones is going this way when you have your baby, and then all of a sudden you give birth, boom, your hormone drop, which is true. But why is it in other cultures it didn't have the same effect? In our culture, it would cause postpartum depression. If it's universal and if it's um, a physiologic, then I think we should have lots of stories in other cultures about the boogeyman getting them in during the postpartum period. There, but, but this study showed that it didn't exist. Well, in, in industrialized nations, we have 50 to 85 percent of people experiencing baby blues, and 15 to 25 percent experiencing postpartum depression. That's sort of similar data. And when they looked at, well, so what about these traditions that are protective? And these are the five things they were able to analyze and, and sort of summarize. One is a distinct postpartum period, meaning there's a name for that period, but it's very defined time. So for the Chinese, it's, the, it's called joy yu I mean, you sit in the month. Sitting the month is 30 days. You sit the month for 30 days. In Mexican culture, it's the 40 days. Mm -hmm. In different cultures, it's usually around that, 30, 40, some even 60. So there's a name. Each culture has a name for that. When you say that name, people know exactly what you're referring to. Okay. But when we talk about postpartum, we think of a postpartum depression. It's not There's a period of time that women goes through that we need to take care of them during that period of time. There's no, we don't have that same concept. So other things that are protective are protective measures reflecting the new mother's vulnerability. So that idea that yes, birth is risky. But of course, in the olden days, it's even more risky. So if you visit any old cemeteries, if you go visit the old town, you visit the cemetery, you're gonna see a lot of very young women's tombstones. 17, 18, 19, and chances are good they die in childbirth. That's not long ago. It's probably a hundred, you know, a little bit over a hundred years ago. So it, it, it was dangerous, and it still is. And I think that's what a lot of other cultures recognize. So there's a, a lot of recommendations about, oh, man, don't leave the house for 30 days, or don't wash your hair. But what we want is not just looking at those very specific recommendations, but we want to look at what's behind that recommendation. Okay, so if they don't want you to leave the house for 30 days, what is it that in those days leaving the house means? That may mean, you know, 
exposure to, to, to the, the elements because 100, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, rules would not be paid. Um, when you go out of the house, it means you'd be working in the fields, but in the modern time, you go out of the house and you're going shopping. You're going to be driving to where you want to go. So it's very different. But So we don't want to take just the recommendations. Oh, don't wash your hair, don't go up. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what are some of the reasons behind some of those recommendations. So, so that's what we want to capture. So that's going to be part of that, that um, postpartum wisdom we want to learn more from, from different cultures. So another factor is social seclusions and mandated rest. You have to rest. But along with that is functional assistance, not only just telling women that you've got to rest, but the providing the help. So the, everybody in the village will be providing the help. So, so the, the collective mothers, the mother, and the mother's playing the role is to mother her new infant. But in our society, is the mother is on her own, mothering herself and the infant. And then social recognition of her new role. So many cultures, once you become a mother, you, you are elevated to a new status in that society. So some of the factors that lead to this abandonment, so these are things that are good. Uh, why were they abandoned? And I think that has a lot to do with because the emerging modern medical system, so there was a abrupt uh, disengagement of, of anything old. Industrialization, migration of people to distant land, and not distinguishing wisdom from now. So industrialization, so now we have a workforce that has to leave their hometown to work in the city. This industry means factories, mean large number of people working in particular places. But prior to that, people would be living in farms, in much scattered community in, in, a, in a different setting. So industrialization brings about some of that abandonment of traditional uh, wisdom because there was people are no longer living in that setting. And migration of people to distant lands. So there are forced migration, for example, African American were forced to come to this country, not by free will. Native American were systematically removed from their homeland to be housed in a totally different environment. So all of, so some of their, their, their knowledge of a postpartum period are going to be erased because now they've been removed from their homeland. So there's a break in the transmission of postpartum period knowledge. So another way for look, us to look at it is immigrant moms. The number, the birth to immigrant women triples since 1970. So if you look at that, then you would also say that their death should also triple. Because if there are more, you know, more women giving birth, and if they, if they die at the same rate, then. But we don't see that. Because the community that has the most immigrant women, so I would say uh, the Hispanic community and the Asian community, both communities have very large immigrant population, yet the death rate is not higher. Okay, so that's another reason for us to think, well, is there something that these communities know that would be of benefit to other populations? So the, the last conjecture is that individualism. So individualism is the social theory of freedom of action for individuals over collective or state control. And I think that came from uh, industrializations and just the changing in, in how society is formed. We tend to value our individualism a lot, you know, but, it, but I think we probably paid a very, very high price for it. So there's strong individualistic tendency in the United States. There's a lack of social collective structure. So even intergenerational, there's isolations. People tend not to be living with their parents or grandparents. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the idea that, that, that new mothers, is, uh, there's, there shouldn't be collective support for new mothers because, well, they decided to, to have a baby on their own. This is on them, that they need to do it, uh, to be taking care of herself by herself. So all this get aggregated in terms of when time when you need help is going to be very difficult. 
that's going to increase people's stress. It's very difficult to measure individualism, but these are some of the data we could sort of rely on to say, oh, is it getting worse or is it getting better? But it seems like I'll see this kind of effect. There's increased surgery, um, certain attitudes toward postpartum period, a lack of resources in the postpartum period. Racism, that there has always been an increased risk for black women in um, during the postpartum period, and it's been long standing. So it's not something unique in the last five years or 10 years. So sexism contributes to it. Abandonment of postpartum wisdom, so we no longer know what works. Individualism, because when we need help, we don't have a collective way of dealing with that. So just imagining when you go through a postpartum period, these are some of the, their experience. So new mothers recovering from giving birth need to care for the newborn, and often it's done in isolation. They have to rely on a for-profit uh, a for profit healthcare system with the capital attitude post postpartum. That's why Serena Williams, she knew what she had, but she had to struggle to get the healthcare system to pay attention to her. And she has money, so she's not a poor, you know, uh, unwed mother or something that people tend to dismiss, but she was wealthy in her top physical shape, and yet she still had to deal with the healthcare system in this way. Okay, so there's no societal collective support. 25% of new mothers have to return to work within two weeks, within two weeks. We recognize how important the doulas are. So San Francisco just recently passed a, uh, I don't know what it is that they passed, but the, uh, not a law, but uh, whatever they passed. But they are recommend, oh, 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 okay, they got funding, private funding, for the public health department to provide doulas to low-income women. So that is phenomenal. Postpartum food services, so if you're wealthy enough,